All right, we're going to be in John chapter 14 today in verses 25 through 31. And when we consider the world around us, we see lots of trial and tribulation, lots of reason to not have peace. And, and there's all sorts of problems that go on, and Jesus told us to expect this, right? In John 16, 33, he says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. There's tribulation everywhere we look, and there's always another excuse to have something else that is a symptom of this tribulation, right? There's, uh, we just saw... Uh, footage was released on Friday, this man murdered in Memphis. And it, the, the beating's inexcusable, and now there's going to be riots going on, or there have been, and there's all sorts of trouble that happens. And if that's not bad enough, we're in uh, a, an egg crisis, right? And you go to the grocery store and, and spend $8 a dozen on eggs. We have chickens, so we don't worry about that. But, um, but everything's more expensive. And you look at war between Russia and Ukraine, and you look around the world and you see people in hunger and people that are homeless and you just see brokenness everywhere. You see relationships, whether it's between a husband and wife or whether it's uh, families that are dealing with issues or you have a uh, breakdown in between coworkers or friends or a uh, breakdown amongst rival political parties, whatever you want to look at, there's problems everywhere. A and the world tries to solve some of these problems. That, that's one thing the world cannot deny is they look around and they say, this isn't the way it should be, right? And, and maybe your idea of what it should be is different than another person's idea of what it should be. But everyone can say, all is not well. All is not as it should be because there's brokenness in the world. And the most ardent pagan that denies the existence of God will say, Things are not as they should be. They'll admit that there is a problem somewhere. And so they try and come up with different ways to fix this. There's uh, therapy, there's prescription drugs, there's alcohol, there's illegal drugs. You have uh, people in, in sexual promiscuity, um, people that just run away from their problems. There's violence, there's hate, there's war. Uh, people think they can go on social media and fix the whole world by arguing with other people on social media. They start charities. They do global conferences and summits of the elite of elite of the world to try and solve all of these problems because they say there's something wrong here. And not everything I just listed is bad, but everything I just listed is broken because the answer to the difficulty is not whatever solution you want to take off, the answer is Jesus. So the world around us tries to fix this problem. They try to have peace, but you're not going to have peace by having whoever you want in the Oval Office. You need Jesus. And you're not going to have peace by getting a, a different coworker or a new manager. The problem is, is that people don't have Jesus. And you don't need to leave your wife. You need Jesus. And you don't need to run away from your problems, you need Jesus. And the, the, the disciples here in chapter 14, we're weeks into this. We've been talking about this for a long time. You know Jesus is leaving, and they're dismayed, and they don't know what to do. And the answer is still Jesus. But in this, as we close out, we're going to be in verses 25 through 31. Jesus is going to call them to three different things. And they're all ours, so it's really easy, right? He's going to call them to reflect. And then he's going to call them to rest. And then he's going to call them to resolve. We're going to walk through these three things today. Reflection, rest, and resolve. And I think these three different things feed directly into each other. You can rest because of what you reflect on in Christ. And you can resolve to go do something because you can rest in Christ. So if you would now please with me for the in respect for reverence and or in respect for the reading of God's word please stand and we're going to read verses 25 through 31 of John chapter 14 These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you 
but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that it, when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded. So the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the, the gift of the Holy Spirit that resides in each and every believer. Lord, bless us as we consider this today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So Jesus starts here with reflection. He says, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. Jesus is talking about the teaching that he's just been working through. And as we've studied the last few weeks, he's telling him the Holy Spirit is coming. In Jesus, you see an outward temporary presence in the disciples' lives of God. He was there. He was with them. They had these three, three and a half years to spend time together. And they're going to miss him. But Jesus is saying, you're no longer going to have this outward temporary manifestation of me. You're going to have an internal, eternal presence of me in the Holy Spirit. The helper, he had mentioned the helper earlier in chapter 14, and now he defines the helper. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. He is leaving, so he encourages these men this way, and he wants them to reflect and think back on the difference that has to take place in their lives. You don't have me anymore. You're not going to have me walking next to you, but the Holy Spirit is going to reside in you. And if you really love me, if you're really one of my children, the Holy Spirit is going to make a difference in your lives, and you're going to behave differently. Alexander McLaren, one of my favorite theologians, put it this way. He said, your theology is nothing unless its distinct outcome is morality. And you must be prepared to accept the painful, the punitive, the purifying influences of that divine spirit on your moral natures if you want to have his enlightening influences shining on the truth as it is in Jesus. The truth that's in Jesus is going to make a difference in your life, and if it doesn't, there's a big problem. And you have to be willing to endure that painful, punitive, purifying influence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Why can the unbeliever sin and it doesn't matter to them? There's no Holy Spirit convicting them. The believer, you turn to Christ, you seek after him. The Holy Spirit comes after you at, or comes into you at the point of your salvation. And then as you pursue Christ as a believer, you live life according to the word of God. The Holy Spirit convicts you of sin. And sometimes it hurts because we mess up a lot. And we need the Spirit to work in our hearts. And so Jesus is saying, let's think back on what I've said to you. I'm leaving, but you have the Holy Spirit coming. And, and we're going to get here for just a moment into a little bit of church history and theology. And forgive me, but it matters. And, and we see evidence in the world today of division in this theology. Looking at verse 26, he says, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. You would not believe the theological divide that, concern, that comes concerning the words, whom the Father will send in my name. So we have been talking about the Trinity, and last week I just kind of fell all over myself trying to somehow explain the Trinity to you. But the members of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are all equal, right? They possess the same attributes. They, they are uh, equally God, but the way that they relate to each other 
and the way they reveal themselves to us are the primary differences in the persons of the Godhead. And the way that re- they relate to each other is where you get into this theological discussion, right? You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, the Son is, what? Begotten of the Father, right? And we're not going to get into this right now, but the Son is eternally begotten of the Father because the Son was not created. He was not born one day in his spirit. He has eternally been there. It's a relationship kind of issue. Well, in the Nicene Creed in 325 AD, we found that they said that the, father, that the Spirit proceeds from the Father. So the Spirit comes out from the Father. But about 200 years later, somewhere in there, we don't know when this was written, in the Athanasian Creed, it says that the Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. This is important because it gives us distinguishing characteristics between Son and Spirit and equality between Father and Son. So the Son is begotten from the Father, but the Spirit comes out of, the word is spirates in, in, in Latin. It's breathed out, like we use aspirate, right? The, the Spirit spirates, he comes out of, he's breathed out of both the Father and the Son. And you'd say, is that a big deal? Well, outside of Protestant Christianity, you have in the Christian realm, we would not say they are true believers because they're seeking, uh, the, um, they're seeking peace with God through works rather than through the work of the Holy Spirit. But you have the Catholic Church and you have the Eastern Orthodox Church. Now, the Eastern Orthodox Church exists because it's split from the Roman Catholic Church because of this issue. The Eastern Orthodox Church declares that the Spirit only proceeds from the Father, and the Roman Catholic Church says that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. This is one of uh, a few issues, there's not many, but one of a few points of theology that we would say, yes, Roman Catholics, we're on board, good job. So there is a big division here because of the split in the church. And, and the Athanasian Creed wasn't even written by Athanasius. It was years after his death. But uh, if you ever uh, hear about Athanasius or you think, hey, is this a good guy or bad? We're on the same team as Athanasius. Um, he was standing against Arius when Arius said that Jesus wasn't divine. And so the Athanasian Creed comes out of the teachings of Athanasius, um, but was written probably 80 to 100 years after his death. Um, but why, why is that in this passage, or where do we draw that from this passage? He says, whom the Father will send in my name. So the Father is sending the Spirit. But you have to remember, Jesus has a close personal relationship with the disciples. He's been with them one-on-one for a long time. And the disciples know Jesus, and they're fearing Jesus is leaving. The Father's always been in their world, Right? They're good Jews. They grew up as Jews. Uh, They have a grave respect. They wouldn't even say the name Yahweh, right? Uh, They grew up going to synagogue. They knew of God the Father. But Jesus is brand new to them. And and Jesus tells the disciples, okay, yeah, the the Father, you know I I come from him, and he and I are one. We've already discussed this. But uh, the Father is sending the Spirit, but he's sending the Spirit in my name, And we've talked about this before, too. The the idea of the name doesn't seem significant to you and I today. But in this day, someone's name was everything about them. It comprised their entire person. So when Jesus says he's coming in my name, he's coming as an emissary of me. You had me. Now you get him who's part of me. He proceeds out of me. Again, that word spirates or breathes. He breathes out or I breathe him out to give him to you. So the Father and the Son sending the Spirit is an incredibly impactful thing to the disciples because they're going to miss Jesus. They know the Father is still there, but he says the replacement that's coming, it's in my name. And in fact, if you say, well, it's kind of weird that Jesus would say he breathes out the Spirit or that we would take that from there. In John chapter 20, And verse 22, um, it says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. So Jesus breathes out the Spirit on the disciples. It's that 
th- that's where that theology comes from. He proceeds in that it's the very nature of Christ and that comes out to these specific people. And the reason this matters for us is that these members of the Trinity don't differ from each other in their attributes. They, del- they differ in their relationship to each other. So to have this good, distinct Trinitarian nature, we have to know what happens here. And uh, if you have further questions on this, it's a really big book and it looks scary, but Dr. MacArthur's Systematic Theology is fantastic. It's a big white book with uh, kind of gold print all over it, um, but it's really helpful and super accessible. So if you want to read more on this, if you have questions, you can certainly come to me. Um, but it helps us draw some lines as we try and figure out the mystery of the Trinity. And so uh, one of the names that we give to Christ is Emmanuel, or the scripture gives to Christ is Emmanuel, right? Which means God with us. And so Jesus is saying, disciples, God is with you when I'm here, but the Spirit's coming, and so God is still with you. He's extending that personal relationship that he has with them to the Spirit that would reside in them. He wants them to find rest in the Spirit. And he's saying, think about all the stuff we've talked about. Think about all that I've taught, and and this conversation in particular of the Spirit coming to you, you need to reflect on that. And then the next thing he goes to is rest, right? Uh, Or forgive me, I, I skipped a part here in verse 26. It says, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, what is he gonna do? He will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. This is a oft misinterpreted passage uh, because we think, hey, then I don't really need to worry about it. Uh, Jesus or the Spirit is just going to speak into my mind and I'll know what to say. Um, That's not what he's talking about here. Uh, This is confidence for us in that the disciples were supernaturally empowered by the Holy Spirit. He will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. In uh, Dr. Sproul's commentary, R.C. Sproul on John, he talks about the idea that uh, the disciples followed Jesus everywhere he went. And I forget the, there's a Latin name for it. There's a Latin name for everything, right? Uh, But Jesus taught while he walked around. Sometimes they would sit down, but most often with the disciples in particular, you're following him everywhere, right? That Talk about the, the dust of his sandals being kicked up on his disciples as they follow him. So the disciples aren't walking around with a notebook and pen uh, cataloging every single detail. Um, they didn't even have pens, right? Uh, it would have been much harder to write on the go. Praise the Lord for modern technology. But they, they didn't have this ability to sit there and, and take de- detailed notes and, and figure all this out. But supernaturally, they were empowered by the Holy Spirit to remember what was there, to write down what was supposed to be written down, to have all these events cataloged. And even this is a a shadow of what's really here, right? Uh, There is an idea in uh, Christendom, and uh, when we're talking about a textual criticism or, or the way we look at the Bible or how it got here, and this idea is mark and priority. Uh, The idea of mark and priority is that the gospel of Mark was written first, and the other three Gospels really just kind of copied off of Mark. Uh, This doesn't work well when you look at an accurate view of when the Gospels were written. It's a way to get around the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and say, hey, we can explain why these things came and why they're so similar in, in the Gospels, particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke. A verse like John 14, 26 gives us great confidence that you don't have to have mark and priority. You can have the Spirit speaking through men to write down exactly what he intended to be written. And, and they, they say Mark is, is the first one because it shares, uh, it, it's, it's kind of the, the center point of the, the, the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels. And it has not just centered in the order of the Bible, but in the, in the material it contains. There's a bunch of Matthew and Mark, and there's a bunch of Luke and Mark, and there's extras on both, but they probably just use this as what these critics would say. Uh, You don't have to worry about stuff like that as a believer, because 
We believe that God spoke through men to give us the word that we have today. And he inspired their minds through, their, through his spirit to give us what we have now. But he talks about, uh, with the disciples, this idea of reflect, think on what's happened. And then he immediately goes to the idea of rest. Now, why would that be the order? Reflect on everything I've said to you, and then there's rest or peace. In verse 27, he says, Peace, I leave you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You've heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father. And for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that, it was, so that when it does take place, you may believe. Why would he go from reflection to rest or, or peace? It's because when we think on what God has done, when we think on who God is, when we think on what God has given us, we can have peace. And and he mentions two different kinds of peace here. He says, or two different elements of peace. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Why would he distinguish? Why would he say, I leave you one thing and give you one thing? Now first, let's look to define peace. One commentator said, it's that absence of spiritual unrest and that assurance of salvation and of God's loving presence under all circumstances, with which, or sorry, which results from exercising faith in God and in his Son and from the contemplation of his gracious promises. It's the absence of spiritual unrest. It's assurance of salvation. In uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7, Paul says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus here is talking about the same kind of peace that Paul does. Because he says that there's a peace that, Paul says there's a peace that passes all understanding. And Jesus says, I give you peace in a way that the world doesn't give you peace. And he says, my peace I leave to you. So there's, there's a legacy kind of peace, right? And you can picture the disciples, what they're dealing with here and losing their leader, but they've known great peace, right? We've said in in past weeks, they had the guy that had all the answers. Jesus was there and he always did the right thing and he never did the wrong thing, right? If you're in a, a discipling relationship with someone and you're the discipler working with the disciple, you can't give them perfect peace from you because you mess up. We're imperfect. Now we can say, follow me as I follow Jesus. And you should look for people to, be, for, to, to disciple you, for you to be discipled by, that you can look at their lives and say, that person lives like Christ. Not perfectly. None of us are perfect. But you should look to somebody and say, this person emulates Jesus. And so I can follow them. But Jesus did it perfectly. And, and he, his teachings confounded minds. He speaks in parables and short pithy pithy sayings. That's part of the whole uh, discipling as you're walking from place to place too, right? You can't write everything down. So Jesus never minces words and always gets exactly to the point. And you get these short, incredibly robust sayings that fully flesh out the teachings of Christ. That's why we can take one phrase, like in Our Lady's Bible study in, in, in uh, the Beatitudes, we take one short verse and talk about it for an hour because Jesus wrapped everything up perfectly. But he gives them his, his teachings, he leaves them his example, and he has this legacy of peace. But he also says, my peace I give to you. This is peace that comes from the Holy Spirit and from the assurance of your salvation. You have a hope in a future. Not just the, the rapture that we all would look forward to, not just Jesus coming back in the air, but and I say just, that's not inferior at all. It's fantastic. But it's not only that. It's that if you die and you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, there's a resurrection from the dead. 
There is a second life that comes. And so Jesus gives them this peace. And he gives them the, the peace in a way, or it's a, it's a kind of peace that the world can't even touch. Right? Uh, if, if you know the story of Polycarp, Polycarp was John's disciple. Right? He uh, lived a while after Paul's death. He was a younger man, or, or than John, I'm sorry. Uh, he's a younger man than John. But at 85 years old, he's told to deny the faith. And and if he doesn't, they're going to burn him at the stake. And right before he goes to be killed, they say, deny him. Just sign this. Say, I don't believe this anymore. And Polycarp says, these 85 years, my Lord's been faithful to me. How can I be unfaithful now? Right? And it's not just this piece that Jesus leaves with him, this, this example that, that he's seen you know, from Jesus to John and, and, and the peace that's there through the teachings and the example of Jesus, but it's a peace given to him because he knows that he's going to be burning for a minute and with Jesus forever. Right? It's a peace that the world can't give because the, the world can't understand someone that would say that. Well, why wouldn't you just say it, this, this one thing? Just say it and be done with it, and, and then you, know, you can go on and, and finish out your days in peace. But there's no peace when you deny Christ. There's no peace when you leave that teaching. The world can't offer you peace. The world can offer hardship and brokenness. And we see this in the world around us today. Th there's all sorts of ways that the world strives to seek after peace. One of the most common in our country is abortion, right? You don't want the burden of this child, so you're going to get rid of it. But outside of the fact that the Bible clearly teaches that this is murder, there's a report from CBS News that says, results indicate quite consistently that abortion is associated with moderate to highly increased risks of psychological problems subsequent to the procedure. This is from a, a study done um, in the British Journal of Psychiatry. For this study, researchers analyzed data on 877,000 women, including 164,000 who had an abortion. They found women who had an abortion experienced an 81% increased risk for mental problems. Women who had an abortion were 34% more likely to develop an, an, an anxiety disorder 37% more likely to experience depression, 110% more likely to abuse alcohol, 155% more likely to engage in suicidal acts, and 220% more likely to use marijuana. What about getting rich? The world says to get rich to have peace, to gain everything you can for yourself. The National Library of Medicine cites a 2007 study that says affluent youth reported significantly higher levels of anxiety across several domains and greater depression. They also reported significantly higher substance use than inner city students, consistently indicating more frequent use of cigarettes, alcohol, marijuana, and other illicit drugs. So money didn't fix the problems. Well, maybe you should just be promiscuous and do whatever you want and, and sleep with whoever you want. A 2013 study from the Journal of Community Medicine and Health Education concludes, as the number of lifetime partners increases, the prevalence of sadness, suicide ideation, making a suicide plan, and attempting suicide also increases. This relationship between mental health and number of, of partners occurs across all ethnic and racial categories. And that's three quick examples that the world would say, do this to be free. Do this to make your life better. And it never does. The world can't give you peace. The world can't offer peace in, in any regard because there's not Jesus. And the peace that Jesus gives is entirely different. It's a peace that the world cannot understand. And I deal with this all the time when I counsel people. Because if, if someone comes into the counseling room and, and they're an unbeliever and, and they don't want to have anything to do with the Lord, they don't believe in God, I don't know how to help them. God is sovereign. He's over all things. And if you love him, he'll work all things together for your good and for his glory. To, to the unbeliever, there's no hope. I can go to a book like Proverbs or Ecclesiastes and say, 
here are good principles by which you should live your life that in general truth make the world an easier place for you to live. But there's no real hope. There's no real future because the world can't give peace. I can assure the believer of the absolute sovereignty of God and his care for them. The unbeliever, I can assure that they stand as an enemy of God and against him. You, as a believer, are in a place of uh, privilege and blessing that the world cannot know. Jesus leaves peace that the world cannot offer, and he gives us peace through the hope of his coming, through the hope of the resurrection, while all the unbeliever has is uncertainty. And he tells the disciples here, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And that neither let them be afraid is actually a really bad translation. The, the Greek word is not phobos, like we get phobia. It's deliato, which means to be a coward or to be cowardly. It's, it's an interesting turn here because Jesus is being encouraging, but the disciples have a job to do. Right? He says, I offer you peace. And sometimes as Christians, we really like the peace side of it. And we think, oh, yes, I can just go over here and rest in Jesus. But there's a reason that Jesus gives us peace. There's work to be done. We're going to get to the resolve portion here in a minute. But Jesus says, I give you peace that the world cannot know. Don't be a coward. Because there's something to do. And Jesus here isn't being soft and light with these men. He cares for them, but he expects them to be brave and to do the right thing. And the world doesn't want anything to do with this. Our society wants men to be soft. And, and being a man doesn't mean you have to be able to bench press 400 pounds. I can't bench press 400 pounds. But you have to be willing to serve the Lord and to stand up for what's right and to not back down, even though the world hates it. Because the world does hate us. Jesus said it hated me before you. Why would you expect anything different? You have to be willing to hold the line, to have hard conversations, and to do what you know honors the Lord. And in verse 28, he says, You've heard me say to you, I am going away, I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Jesus almost kind of condemns them here and says, are you so selfish? I've told you I'm going back to the Father. Why, why would you be sad about that? Jesus gets to go to God. He's one of their best friends. He's their leader, and he gets to leave this world of difficulty and persecution and go back to the Father. You know, the only time that, or sorry, the last time Jesus experiences that real difficulty of being a man, of feeling that kind of pain, is on the cross. Because in that one moment, he paid the penalty for our sins. There, there, there's no more payment there. It's done. It was a one-time payment. You know what Jesus is doing now? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's having perfect unity as part of the Godhead. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to come back and get his church, and then he's going to have a wedding feast with them. And it's going to be a seven-year celebration. And then you know what he's going to do? He's going to come back in judgment. And he's going to rule for a thousand years. And no one will be able to stand against his rule. And then you know what he's going to do? He's going to fight a battle. And he wins. Right? We, we see Jesus come, and then there's this, this thousand years, and then there's the final battle, and Satan's released with all of his uh, demons, and then the, all the unbelievers that have been born and, and, and lived throughout the millennial kingdom, they all rise up, and they think they're going to win. And it's just over. Right? And you don't have to be afraid of that final battle, because guess what? On the Lord's side, there is zero casualties. There's not even wounds. Jesus 
wins. So he's telling the disciples, this is what I have in front of me. It's just going to be winning from here on out. I get to go back to the Father. And guess what I'm doing when I go to the Father? I'm going to prepare a place for you. He told them back in the beginning of chapter 14 and verses 1 through 3. And if I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The disciples should be rejoicing that Jesus goes to the Father. Because if he doesn't go, the, the whole process doesn't continue. Right? It's, it's like the, the mother that, that gets pregnant with a child and they're scared of going through labor. And I've been told it's very painful. And it's like, you want to have another kid? How about you give birth this time? Well, the Lord doesn't do that. But the, you, you, you look forward to, to the baby coming, but there's pain in between. And sometimes for us, yeah, we, we look forward to, to the Jesus one day, but we kind of lose sight of the here and now because of the pain that comes. And honestly, in our context, we know very little of the pain of being a Christian, most of us. But Jesus says, you, you should love that I'm going to the Father. And he says in verse 29, and I have told you before it takes place so that, it, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I've told you now so that there's no doubt. He provides them even more assurance. He gives more peace. I'm going. I'm leaving. Let this bolster your faith. The disciples were looking at a circumstance that Jesus has told them for a long time was going to happen, and they're terrified. And Jesus says, this isn't something that should terrify you. This is something that should build your faith up. You should believe more. Are there circumstances in your life that should be building your faith and instead are scaring you? Guess what, folks? Every trial you face in life is designed to make you more like Jesus. You may not see what it does for your marriage. You may not see what it does for your career. You may not see what it does for your physical body. But it's all designed to make you more like Jesus. James 1 super clear. We don't have time. We won't get to that today. But James 1 is super clear. What you go through makes you more like Jesus. So if you can't see why it's happening, just know it's there to make you more like Christ. You don't want to be like the one that doubts, that's tossed on the waves of the sea. You want to be the one that endures and receives the crown of life because there's peace in him. I'm not saying that some of you aren't going through really hard things. And there's some of you I've spoken with over the last week or months, and I know you're going through some really hard things. But the Lord is faithful to his children. And these trials that you endure can build your faith. You don't have to be afraid. He gives you a peace that the world cannot give. He's left you a peace that the world can't leave you. We reflect on who he is. We reflect on what he's done because that's where we find our peace. It's all in him. He says, you're not supposed to be cowardly here. You're supposed to believe. And then he brings them to resolve. He says, reflect, rest, and resolve. He says, I will, in verse 30, I will no longer talk much with you. For the ruler of this world is coming. This could be a scary statement if he ends there. He says, I'm not going to be around you much longer because Satan's coming. And sometimes we get afraid as Christians of Satan and his demons. Don't be afraid of Satan. Be aware of him. He walks about like a roaming lion seeking whom he may devour. 
but you have the armor of God, Ephesians 6 tells us. And Christ already has the victory. At the very beginning of the sermon, I read John 16, 33, and Jesus says, I have overcome the world. Satan isn't running rampant on this earth right now. He still asks God for permission, just like he did with Job in Job chapter 1. You know, Satan couldn't lay a finger on Job until God gave him permission. And once he did, he could only affect him so far he couldn't take his life. That's how impotent Satan is. He can't kill one man without God giving him the permission to do so. Don't be afraid of him. Don't be afraid of the, the, the paganism that's rising up around us. Be aware of it, but don't be afraid. You know, I was in, uh, on a mission trip in Haiti. This was six, seven years ago, something like that. And uh, we're going around passing out tracks. And there's the witch doctor's house. And the missionary says, oh, no, no, you can't. Don't go there. That's the witch doctor. I'm not afraid of a witch doctor. You got Jesus. Satan can't do anything to us. Can people afflict your body? Absolutely. Can somebody kill you? Yeah, they can. Can't do one thing unless God lets them. Don't be afraid of the world around you. Don't fear the trial because Jesus has already won the battle. And he says right here, as soon as, he, as soon as he says that, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. He can't do it. You know that Satan thought he had it all won at the cross. I killed God. And he knew Jesus was God because Jesus created him. And when he went up and tried to rebel against God, Jesus was the one he's rebelling against as part of the Trinity. But he says, he has no claim on me. See, Jesus doesn't fear Satan. Why was, he in, why was he in agony before going to the cross? Because he knew that the wrath of the Father was coming down on him. Nothing to do with Satan. This all fits into, the, into God's plan. We're told as much in Acts 2. According to the, the will and foreknowledge of God, Jesus was crucified. Satan has no claim. He says, but I do as the Father has commanded me. So the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Jesus is ready to die. He knows what's coming. We still have a little longer in the upper room here uh, in chapters 15, 16, 17. But Jesus knows where he's headed. And he says, come on, guys, it's time to go. And Jesus was resolved to go and die for you and me. He wasn't afraid. He's telling the disciples, don't be a coward. There's work to do. Get up. Let's go from here. So wh what do we do with this? And I think it's pretty clear, right? Reflect on God, who he is, and what he's done for you. And maybe you're in the midst of a really dark trial right now. Look back. Look and see his faithfulness, even in little things throughout your life. Reflect on the fact that he's given you his Holy Spirit. If you love Jesus Christ, as he just told us earlier in chapter 14, if you are one of God's children, God himself resides in you. Reflect on that. Because Thinking about that, we'll charge hell with the squirt gun. Because the Spirit resides in you. When it's time to take that stand with your family, know that the Spirit resides in you. When it's time to witness that coworker and you're afraid, know that the Spirit himself resides in you. When that trial comes, reflect on the fact that the Spirit himself resides in you. 
God is in you. Not that pagan little God theology junk. Right? You are not God. But God himself resides in you if Jesus is your Savior. There's immense hope there. Are you anxious? God is inside of you. Are you depressed? God is in, inside of you. We should rejoice. We should be bold. We should proclaim who he is and what he's done because we have his Holy Spirit. Reflect on this regularly. And what does that give you? It gives you rest. It gives you peace that the world cannot know. Peace that Jesus leaves you. Peace that Jesus gives you. Who he is, what he's taught, and then what he's going to do. And the spirit you have in you now. Rest in Christ. Christians should not be tossed to and fro like the people of this world. You shouldn't be an emotionally unstable person. You should be grounded in Christ because of what he's done for us. And finally, resolve. Jesus has already defeated Satan. He's in his death throes, right? He's writhing about. You, you know, Jesus is going to come back. Satan gets seven years while we're in heaven. And then he's in a pit, falling continually for a thousand years. Bottomless pit, right? God can just put him there in a moment. And, and, and he's falling in this pit for a thousand years, and then he's let out only to be, be defeated and thrown into the lake of fire for all of eternity. That's all that awaits him. Don't be afraid of the world. Don't fear what someone can do to your body. Fear God who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Resolve to follow after the Lord and to do what he's commanded you to do. To be bold, to share the gospel, to have confidence in him. In the midst of tremendous hardship, have confidence in him. I can't imagine sweeter words than for the God who made all things and who upholds all things by the word of his power to say to you and to say to me, my peace, I leave you. My peace, I give to you. Reflect on who he is. Rest in what he's done. And resolve to live for him. Let's pray. Father, you are worthy of all glory. You are worthy of us to live perfect lives that absolutely, identically emulate your son and that bring you glory as he perfectly brought you glory. But Lord, we fail so often. These disciples whom Jesus was speaking to were going to fail often. But Lord, I pray that in the midst of our failure, we would not just look to our failings, but that we would look to Christ. that we would reflect on who you are and on what you've done, that we would reflect on the fact that you have given us the Holy Spirit, and that would just bring us to perfect peace and rest. Jesus told the disciples what was going to happen. And Lord, through your word, you've told us what is going to happen. So we can have peace that's not as the world gives, but peace that Jesus has left us and given us. And Lord, if there is someone here today that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray that you would bring them that peace. You would put belief in their heart that they would turn from their sins, repent of their sins, and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Lord, for the believer, that we would resolve 
based on this piece, based on this reflection, to follow after you, to live our lives for your glory, because you are worthy of that glory. And we don't have to be afraid of this world, not because we are great, not because we are smart enough, we don't know enough about the Bible to, to make it possible. We are not strong enough. But Lord, we don't have to be afraid of this world because Jesus has already won the victory. Lord Jesus, dying on that cross changed everything. And I ask, Lord, that you would help us to live like it. To reflect on what you've done. To rest in who you are. And to resolve to live to your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.